welcome all of you. And see, this particular panel on advocacy and policy and activism is really what DIVAS is all about. And I just want to take about two minutes and, and, and give you a backstory of, about DIVAS and why we are you know, doing this. So there are really um, three um, important um, things that happened that made me launch or, or um, you know, create uh, uh, DIVAS, which is an NGO for um, you know, women's health in general, but particularly diabetes and NCDs and girls and women. So first is, you know, in my own clinical practice, I was beginning to see um, a lot of diabetes and gestational diabetes and, and complications in, in women. And I also saw the how this was not being addressed with a, through a gender lens. And their experience was completely different, but we were not, you know, looking at that. So I thought it's time to talk about that, look into that. The second thing is, um, in 2003, I had actually gone back to the U.S. for about for a few years, and I, uh, that was the time the Go Red movement, Go Red for Women by the American Heart Association was launched, and the center where I was at Rush University was one of the big centers with Dr. Wogman, Annabel Wogman as the head, and I must tell you, probably the single most reason, single you know the reason that I you know, wanted to do this for diabetes, and I saw what happened with um, heart health when this Go Red movement was launched. It was simply um, an awareness movement. But what it also did was brought all the women cardiologists together, and, um, and they banded together, and, and they took this upon themselves. The, the men were also involved, but the women cardiologists primarily came together. There was a red dress movement, including the first lady of the United States uh, taking part in the first you know, red dress. And so one more thing that I am so happy and so proud to tell you is in this last 10 years since DIVAS has been in existence, this is the same thing has happened to women endocrinologists and women diabetologists in India. So we have come together for a common purpose. And this sisterhood, which also includes some of the brothers here, all of the brothers here, this sisterhood, I think, is what is going to move the needle and, and uh, actually make uh, changes happen. And lastly, I, I was at a, a WHO meeting in Uruguay a few years ago, and I heard a talk by someone on lessons learned from HIV for NCDs. And, and what this guy said was, you only need four things. Ambition, and I think there's no dearth of ambition. You need money, which we don't have. We need a lot of it. And we need cohesive coming together of everyone, which is what this is. And lastly, activism by the community itself. And, and we really want to promote that and want to encourage that. I know it's happening in type one, but it needs to happen in every aspect of women and NCD. So this is really the basis of this whole program. And um, with that introduction, I want to move on. Yeah. So I think these are some of your slides. Yeah, uh, so just to say that, yeah. Mm. We, we, it's not about men versus women, but simply about promoting women's health. That's all. Um, we, we do want to learn gender differences, but it's nothing, it's not a, a battle of the sexes at all. And of course, to have, um, uh, you know, look at everything through a gender lens and have a gender transformative approach uh, through to health and medicine. Uh. So these are different stages of gender sensitization, starting from gender inequality, being gender blind, gender sensitive, gender specific, and gender transformative. Um. So this um, uh, painting, you can see Dr. Mittal will appreciate it, someone who is a big uh, connoisseur of paintings. Uh, this, on this side, you have women carrying water. And on this side, you have a woman carrying a baby. So Katya Iverson from you know, Women Deliver said this, and I think it's extremely profound. She said, women and girls carry more than babies or water. 
Um, she said they carry families, they carry businesses, and they carry potential. And investing in their health rights and well-being creates a, a positive ripple effect that can lift up communities and even entire countries. And that's really, it's a very powerful statement. And, and that's the essence of what we are going to talk about today, but largely focused on health. Okay. So um, World Diabetes Day 2017 focused on women and diabetes. And uh, uh, that was the theme in 2017, of course. Uh, so this is, uh, so Lancet has taken it as a series of commissions where, where uh, sex disparities in diabetes is being taken up as, a, as an issue and how to bridge that gap. So moving uh, be, um, away from that, so I'll, I think I'll start the panel discussion now. Uh, number one, why are we discussing women and diabetes? Uh, do we think that diabetes in women is different? Is it more difficult? Is it more, more disabling? Is it dis dismissed or deadly? Um, and how it is important to achieve the SDG goals is what the focus is on. Uh, so we'll open the panel discussion. Uh, um, Shall we come back to Hema? Yeah. I, I think I'll start the introduction about this topic now. Uh, we have heard two, two sessions since morning, and we are going to address some of, some of the other sessions which focus on gender. Uh, we have been using sex and gender in the interchangeably, just to highlight what is the difference between the two. When we talk about sex, we, we are talking in terms of biological differences between men, women, or intersex, which involves genes, genitalia, body features, and hormones. Whereas gender is a social construct, how, how a person perceives himself or how a society perceives that per person. So gender includes much more than that. Uh, there is a social construction of gender starting from even before a baby is born, especially in India, when they find out what is the sex of the baby, there is, that is where the social construction starts beginning. It is strongly reinforced in families. As soon as the baby enters school or institutions, this is this gender construct is gender norms, uh, gender stereotypes. They are either reinforced or challenged in certain ways. And over the life course of the woman, there is there are certain expectations. We have heard about how women is supposed to uh, be pregnant, get married. So there are certain norms, certain stereotypes, which is reinforced by society. And why we are putting this slide here is because health cannot be taken separate from society. It's all embedded there. So unless we address the social construct of gender, we won't be addre addressing health uh, effect of gender. However, it inter, uh, intersects with other issues. So gender and race and class, they intersect. So some women may actually be privileged than men of a lower class. So there are intersections. So that intersectionality is also important to understand the effect. If, if the woman is of lower socioeconomic strata, so in that sequence it happens. So race is a one factor which influences health. Class is one factor which influences health. Age is one factor. And there are other factors which can intersect with gender in certain ways. And there are gender pathways to how does gender affect health? Uh, number one, there are gender differences in exposures. We understand there are differences uh, in men and women, how they behave in societies, how men uh, have more, uh, yeah. Uh, Uday? Dr. Uday and Dr. Uday Hema. Uday Tanawala and Hema, please come up here, yeah. Uh, there are gendered health behaviors. There are gendered impacts on accessing care. There are gender biased health systems and gendered bias, health research, and data collection. So all these five pathways we will be discussing in our panel discussion today is ultimately leading to health in inequities and uh, outcomes. So on one hand, we cannot do much about biological changes, but we can change gender norms. Uh, it may be a slow process, but it is something which needs to be done and needs to be addressed. So. So I'll come to the question which we had put for Dr. Hema Devakar. Focusing on women's health also allows us to meet the SDG goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. So how can we reimagine women's health 
as reproductive health and much more beyond reproductive health and expand the dialogue to address all aspects of the well-being. Uh, and this question is posed to Dr. Hema Divakar is because she's the chair of the Well Women uh, program of FIGO. Thanks, both of you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as we say, women is not just a baby producing machine. So it's not only the reproductive age that we need to focus on, but it is a continuum of journey through her ages. It may be right from birth to adolescence, pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, post-pregnancy, post and like how we say happily married ever after. It's forever after. So that's how the continuum should go. And the focus, the reimagination should be ideally around the preventive health care. Because there's so many missed opportunities at every touch point, especially for all the frontline healthcare providers and we as women's and uh, healthcare space, those who are working, we often look back and regret, we could have tackled this beforehand. We would have allowed her to enter her pregnancy phase, optimizing some of these factors which we always had an opportunity. So dear friends, the well women healthcare, as Usha said, it is that you pay attention to preventing the preventable, you pay attention to what could be done right from the start at the grassroots. And another vision of reimagining is use of digital platform for all the three things, the art of using digital platform. A for advocacy, because we need to increase the demand and uh, uh, raise awareness right across the communities. R is for implementation research. There are some out of the box things that we have done in our own country. So let's document that and see what is feasible and pragmatic for South Asian and African regions. T is the training or capacity building, which also the digital platform helps us to reach the last mile. And the use of point of care devices, which will help us reach every girl, every woman through unskilled or semi-skilled healthcare providers who can transmit the data digitally and the experts here as you see the galaxy can interpret and give a word of wise advice. So all of these things put together is to my imagination reshaping and reimagining the healthcare for not only the girls and women but for everybody in countries like ours. Thank you. So the next question is to Dr. Mithil, because how do we evangelize this concept of gender as a determinant of health? Uh, as someone who's a deep experience in clinical practice and also doing a lot of public awareness uh, programs and, uh, and, and being in academics as well. So who, sh who could be the ideal messenger for this? Um, I think, uh, uh, Usha, that we are talking of 50% of the world's population. So everyone has to be a messenger. It cannot be that you know one group just runs a campaign and it's going to work. So if you were to broadly divide the people who can influence this, uh, I would say uh, it would be at the, of course, at the medical level, because uh, that has a lot of uh, sanctity. It has value, it has acceptance. So certainly down the, the, the medical sort of structure, infrastructure, starting with the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, everybody who's involved, they have to be sensitized to this. And that same thing has to come across in the interaction with patients and with people. And I think unless that happens at that level, for example, then the whole thing will fall flat. Because it has taken a lot of time for doctors to get sensitized to weight issues. Uh, for example, we don't use the term obesity at all in our prescriptions and even in our conversation anymore. So you know, all those kind of things have to really come from the top. So that, I think, is very important. And uniform messaging is very important. India, with so many cultural and social and religious and regional differences, it is very important that this kind of health-related messaging doesn't get lost in, in all that. So that is one. So the medical fraternity and the whole medical group is one. The other, I think, which is, uh, and I'm probably going backwards, other is the schools. So I think uh, we have seen the impact that education has on young minds. They are still malleable. Uh, what you pick up in school is what stays with you very often, right till the end. And it's not necessarily easy to do that later on in life. So I think sensitization of schools, uh, school teachers, 
uh, where you have a pretty good gender ratio, generally in most schools. So I think that also is a very, very important area of not stereotyping into, you know, uh, this thing. But school is one area, at least in the larger cities, there's the ratio of women to men as teachers is probably in favor of women. So I think that that can be a very good sort of uh, crucible for, for, for nurturing this. I think it's important also, you know, in, in many ways because uh, you're also, you know, there are two approaches to this. One is the, the incremental approach, which is generally what I try to follow, uh, which is that you make some changes. And even some change is better than no change, right? The other, of course, is the sort of very activist approach which says everything is wrong, and they're often right. They're often right, OK. But the thing is, to reach there, you, you antagonize like one million people, and then you won't, don't get anything done. So my approach in all these changes that we try to bring about in society or in schools is incremental. Let's do this much today. OK, we don't agree on everything. Let's do this much. Let's do the next. And before you realize it, you'll probably hit, uh, you know, you'll be there where you want to be. So, but that is different. Some people may disagree with this, and they question the very concept. And that is very important for thinking, but when you try to implement it that way, you get driven into a corner, and you're not able to do that much. The third group that does this is obviously the family. I mean, the family, it cannot work, what you learn at home. Uh, and these days, I do find a lot of contradiction between what people are told at home versus what they're told in schools. Schools are more egalitarian sometimes, uh, at least in Delhi, I see that. And they encourage a lot of intermixing. And you know, But uh, some of our, 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 our children are very elitist. They've been brought up to think that they are different. And, you know, and the usual teachings don't apply to them. So I think this is important, that all these three parameters, three streams uh, are sensitized to help diffuse this, this gender difference that is happening. Uh, otherwise, you know, for any one person to start a campaign one day doesn't make an, I mean, it's okay, it's good, it's an effort, but it won't really, it's like throwing that one starfish that came on, uh, on the shore and throwing it back, rather than having a mechanism for avoiding the star wishes, starfishes from coming on the shore. So all of us will have to work together. I don't see any other way. Two quick points. I think there are bio natural biological differences between men and women. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't dismiss those. We shouldn't just say, you know, everyone say, you're not the same. You are different, you know. You are different, and we should respect that and honor that, and we all do that, actually. But there should be no difference in the access and quality of care. That is, that is the point. And that care may have to be tailored, as Usha has always been saying, women require some special care through various stages of life. That's OK. But this message is very important also because there is another extreme that women should be doing everything that men do and vice versa and all that. I, again, it's that radical approach which antagonizes many people and you make very little progress. But probably if you do it stepwise, you can, you can read some of that. Thank you, Amrish. The, the only reason we put this question is feel the urgency of now. The problem is so big and, and kind of escalating so fast that um, small organic changes seem like not enough, that we need to come with uh, you know, big, um, uh, big movements or big things like the GORED, something big to uh, make people sit up and take notice or, or, or some things to actually change. So it's just the urgency of now, uh, nothing else. So um, can, thank you. I, I think uh, concluding both the things together, there is a theory called critical ease theory that gradually you'll reach there when it starts fermenting. So the next question is for Dr. Krishna Prashanti. Can women physicians be the change agents? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm representing the chairman of APAPA and the IMA Women Doctors Wing as a national member holding the two posts. Seeing the practice for 25 years, all the poorest of the poor and in the semi-urban village community, I feel primary care physicians, family physicians, particularly women physicians can be the game changers. Because in our practice, we see that still in some orthodox communities, women patients feel little bit of embarrassment to talk some of the urinary complaints or genital complaints or breast complaints to the male doctors. Even in the educated uh, people in the highest of the high positions, they feel comfortable with the women doctors. That is one thing. 
Whenever a diabetic patient is coming to a doctor, that doesn't mean that treating the biochemical reports alone. If we ask something more, do you have any other complaint, then only they will be letting out their feelings. Particularly if you see in the adolescent age, in a family, I am seeing the three generations in a family. If a diabetic patient is coming to me, after taking the prescription and when she is going out, she will be asking, my doctor is having some menstrual problem. What advice do you want to give? My grandmother is there on the bed. Can you give me some advice for us? Like that, if you are seeing one patient, we are almost giving advice to the four patients in the family. So I feel personally, women physicians at all the levels, whether you are in the urban area or in the rural area or in the teaching institute or in the research side, because we'll be more cordial to your family members, more cordial to the relatives, including to your maids, to your paramedics, to your hospital staff. They'll be discussing so many things to us. So we'll be having a lot of insight beyond something. And if you see in between the lines, not only the medical writing of the prescription, you have to see the psycho, social, emotional aspect of treating the patient. I got a 8 years old diabetic child after hearing to me in the All India Radio about the insulin and her father bought to me at that stage of 700 blood sugar which was not recorded on the glucometer and when I told and advised about the insulin and admission, he bought almost from 300 kilometers to Tirupati, he told let the child die. I don't want this child because already I am having four diabetic patients in my house. I am overburdened with insulin. I can't give insulin for a lifetime because she is only 8 years old. Let the child die. As casually he was telling. So if you see each and every patient, the family history because we see the poor people, unless we do something beyond giving the insulin, like what sir was telling about, we have to concentrate on the schools, we have to concentrate on the school teachers, we have to concentrate on at the primordial level, starting from the gynecologists to the pediatricians to the physicians. Everybody, if you have a network so that a child, no, what madam was telling, that it's not like the reproductive age. So if a diabetic patient is coming, it's not the gynec problem. She may be having cardiac, she may be having ophthal problem. So we need a woman's health doctor not only the gynecologist, not only the woman physician, where she can address all the things. So I think there is a need of the hour. We have to impress upon the policy makers. We have to impress upon the community level and we have to impress upon the NGOs and to the administrators at the central government level rather than the conventional way of the treating the diabetic patients like only GDM, only DPC or only IAP or only type 1. No, it's not like that. A type 1 diabetic child with a thyroid, she will be travelling with us for almost 30 to 40 years. So, breaking of the consultations between different specialists and not having an interconnection between these kind of specialists, they will be losing the care. And after marriage, what already we have discussed. So, I feel on behalf of the API and WDW, we need something more and we want to work with all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Krishna Prashanti. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Monica Arora, she wears multiple hats. Um, she's the vice president at, at PHFI for research, uh, has uh, done seminal work in um, NCDs, heads um, the NCD Alliance in India and uh, Gride. So do we need a special task force, preferably women-led for women in NCDs? And can they then disseminate recommendations to policymakers? Thank you uh, for that question and a uh, very important question. We surely need more women leadership, um, not only in the health sector, but overall, globally, if I talk about the figures, um, women health ministers are only 31%. And if we look at the CEOs of the Fortune 500 healthcare, it's 8%. So there is a shortfall of women in these sectors and in leadership positions particularly. So women issues can come to the fore only um, when they are women-led. Uh, those perspectives will come in when they are in the leadership and decision-making capacity. But uh, having said that, I would not forget the role of uh, community. So even men-led organizations have to be sensitive to women's need. And um, the community engagement is absolutely essential when we are talking about uh, issues like diabetes. We all know how girls uh, having diabetes in school settings, parents do not want to reveal it even to the school setting because her chances of getting married will be compromised. So 
there is where the role of community comes in. So not just empowering women um, and uh, girls with type 1 diabetes, but their parents, their community, and the stakeholders is very, very important. And if we look at um, a patient engagement, I'll just cite an example of why we started the whole um, initiative of uh, meaningful engagement of patients of uh, NCDs and diabetes is very much included in that is because we started with community conversations in India through the Healthy India Alliance, which is the India NCD Alliance. There's a global NCD Alliance uh, registered in Geneva and has multiple country level and regional alliances. So when we were doing uh, community conversations with patients, the kind of uh, feedback is when we asked them, what medicine do you take for your diabetes management? The answer was, and this is an urban setting, I'm talking about Delhi. Ek safed goli He didn't even know the name of the medication. So that is where we felt that as public health experts, healthcare providers, we have failed because we have not empowered this patient. And diabetes management requires so much of self-care. So till they don't have that ownership that they are responsible for their own health, it's not the endocrinologist who's responsible for their health, why they are not improving and are not managing it well, is because they lack that knowledge. They are not part of decision making. If it is a treatment pathway, our physicians do not have that kind of time to discuss it with the patient and their families that these are the treatment pathways, which pathway would you like to take? And that is where the role of patients come in. If we are able to empower them, if women patients uh, with diabetes are empowered, then they become a bridge between the health system and the community. They will definitely be better able to manage their own condition, their family's condition, but also they will be able to engage with the community and become health ambassadors. So that is where we feel that the role of women is absolutely essential in leadership, but also at the community level. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. As they say, telephone, telegraph, and tell a woman. So you tell a woman something, it will have a ripple effect and reach more people. Yeah. So, yes. So uh, the next question is for Dr. Uday. Um, how can ESI, RSSGI, IMA, and FOXI or ICOG partner to make NCD prevention and management an urgent priority? Because as we know, pregnancy is a window to future chronic disease. So your thoughts on that? So I think we already are doing a lot uh, uh, for, for the empowerment uh, of women like uh, let me start in my own consulting room, you know, over here. Uh, and let me also tell you that at least Foxy is one organization where the tables are reversed. We've got more women than men, so we are a total minority over there. So, <laughs> but women hold all the <laughs> key cards over there. But anyway, <coughs> more seriously, today as a gynecologist, I see mainly women patients. But now we have started having so many young couples coming where the man is already diagnosed as a diabetes. And when I ask them, what is your HbA1c? Sir, thoda art hai, das hai. No, what is your fasting? And oh, around 2 to 50. I said, so isn't your diabetologist taking care of you? Well, sir, it's, it's you know, so they, they fumble over there until I tell them it is going to affect your sperms. So, uh, so if you don't correct your diabetes, and I tell you, forget the sperms. It is your kidney which is affected silently. It is your eyes which is affected silently. It's your heart which is affected silently. Why the hell don't you take care of your diabetes? And the wife is looking at me and says, you know, very good, you're telling him this because he doesn't listen to me. So I think education, what you are now focusing on today is a great thing. Your one question was, who is the ideal messenger? And Usha, today I think there's nothing like social media or a digital platform to educate the men and the women and the school girls and the adolescent. You know, and that's, I think, uh, uh, we are doing it in Foxy, we are educating. See, we have got only two people amongst the list which you gave. We have the medical fraternity whom we, ca whom we can target and the paramedical staff whom, whom we have got control of and we have teach. We have no control about for schools and all that. But if we as an organization start uh, uh, start a social media platform which is accessible to all the young girls, to all the school children, and you know, give this good health messages that how, what is, what is diabetes and why, 
it is going to affect your whole life and you need to take care of it i think i think the social media platform we have to take and hema is here she is into the digital teaching and uh, uh, dissemination of things uh, my son in law has he had taken up this project about 10 years back with aparna and and for educating all the pregnant women in the villages uh, on the antenatal care so they used to send out these sms's on the first trimester second trimester third to all and so many women were covered and it and benefited it was an ngo i don't remember the name aparna hegre's ngo which which did such a lot of work with him and uh, all the antenatal women are covered so we need to have a social media messaging system which all the organizations can get together have health messages which should be spread in the community and uh, that is the way i think we will need to move forward to make everybody aware of diabetes and its complications and how important to correct it now we have got no answers to what this lady said when the father says i can't afford a fourth child and i can't give insulin we have really no answers so i think there the administration has to do something about it and make it more effectively available in the public hospitals uh, you know like that uh, to, to do something about that but besides that as far as an organization what we are considering disseminating knowledge we have a uh, social media to do that and when you say pregnancy is a chronic uh, 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 is a window to the thing uh, yes we all obstetricians need to screen for gdm we are doing the tipsy test in every trimester many of this have not, not switched over we are urging them to do it uh, and uh, uh, that dipsy test has stood the test of covid in, in covid times who was doing the three step test who was i mean all the other guidelines the american the canadian they all were fumbling let's go back to hba1c oh just take the history in the first trimester don't do any test but we were we were as we were we were just doing a one step test point of care system and we were good with the with the covid test so that is one thing the dipsy test should be propagated as the screening method and once you pick it up obviously manage it and uh, yeah. the and 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 you to to get a good postnatal follow up i have realized that every antenatal visit you have to drum it into their heads that once the pregnancy is over it is not going to get over you have to come and see me after 6 months and every year so unless you do it in every antenatal visit only just telling them when they go home that you come back for follow up does not really work thank, thank you thank you and that question is also coming up um so the reason i put this um, you know we put this question is the ada and the aha the american heart association and the american diabetes association came together to come up with guidelines for uh, diabetes in women so i'm just saying that when powerful organizations come together the 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 muscle and the reach and the power is so much more and also the credibility oh the um, you know um, foxy has said this uh, icog has said this or uh, esi has said this then people will sit up and listen as opposed to coming you know from a Uh, uh, not coming from anyone so um last two years have been turning point in so many ways after covid uh, the way we look at health has changed uh, we understand that health is not just being taken care of by health workers but by so many other sectors covid has, has been an example and it had an overarching impact on all different things including non communicable diseases because the care was interrupted in so many ways the ncds overlap with covid and increase morbidity and mortality so the next question uh, what is covid doing to women again we understand that during covid the gender gap has increased it has we almost uh, regressed now uh, because of so many different reasons uh, so the question is for dr deena and dr usha how has the covid pandemic affected the care of women with diabetes and ncds in low and middle income countries and i'll just put the next question as well has the shadow pandemic of domestic violence and other challenges spilled into their diabetes care as well thank you so much <clears throat> that i'm getting to voice for women in general so um definitely the covid did affect women and i just want to put forward that the first thing sometimes i think that i i may be saying this out loud and inappropriately but sometimes i feel women are their own enemies you know how we always put our families before our sons our 
everything. And then we always tell that how we should propagate like women empowerment. And we say, okay, you know, uh, educate our child, uh, give, uh, tell her that she's equal. But then we'll always go and make the cup of tea, get up and clean the bed. So she's never going to learn till you at home do it right. Till you, during COVID especially, everybody's home. And there, if you are always cooking, always cleaning, and your man is not doing anything, and then she goes to school and we are putting out these programs, and she's coming back home, she's never going to learn. So we really have to put that, that and even with health, if a man has a headache, uh, they'll be like, oh, blood pressure, but yeah, you know, or let's do something for him. But even if she's got like, she's got a fracture, she's probably first going to pick up her son and then, you know, go to the hospital and think, nahi, bas moch a gayi hai, kind of a thing. So sometimes I feel that we need our own women's worth. We have to increase the value of our own. We have to make them believe in themselves. And this will come <laughs> from the first step. And definitely for uh, NCD, I think it was one pandemic after the other, you know, because with diabetes, uh, we always say type 2 diabetes is lifestyle disease. And in COVID, they just gave you like your heaven, no? Stay home, don't exercise, don't go out, don't do anything because you're going to get COVID. So it was giving them that license to do what they actually wanted to do. <laughs> so it was bad. And of course, we, we all have faced that we have the worst compliance for diabetes because it doesn't give you a headache, a fever, it doesn't give you a tummy ache, you know? And you know, you can, like somebody said, with 200 sugars, you know, unless he has erectile dysfunction, he's going to be like, you know, today's Friday or, you know, Saturday, let's make some samosas, you know, fry me something. So, of course, but um, women's health were definitely there, the exercise, you know. Uh, I, I have a few uh, doctor friends myself who say that their weekends are the worst than weekdays. And I can feel that there are people in this room who might feel that. So but definitely that was something. And I think the second question I will, I'll leave to Dr. Usher. So uh, thank you, Dina. I think that was very, very powerful and insightful comments. Um, so what COVID did was, uh, we all know that um, more men got COVID than women. And it was also more, um, what can I say, poorer outcomes in men. Okay, so that actually, I think, um, in, in, in many ways w did some disservice to women. So while the actual COVID virus affected more men, COVID affected more women. More women went below poverty line. More women uh, underwent domestic violence. More girls were out of school. More girls, especially in Africa and other countries, got married. There was greater mental health issues and, and caregiving. So here will be a woman who will be doing telemedicine consultation. I'm talking about uh, doctors um, or, or doing um, some online uh, work, but also attending to the children. They're at home. There's nobody to take care of them and uh, elders. And so there was tremendous caregiving responsibilities. And all I'm saying is this took away um, you know, attention to diabetes and other NCDs. And to boot, we also now know that there's possibly more diabetes happening post-COVID. And a small Chennai day study shows that more women got COVID, uh, post-COVID. So until you know, some national data comes out on that, so more women have gotten COVID, I mean, diabetes after that. And um, so it's just going to increase the, the burden. And we have a question this afternoon in the GDM session that um, many countries are reporting more GDM post-COVID. And probably it's true in our country as well. We'll talk about it in the afternoon session. So COVID has not been good to women. That's all I can say. So, um, so Dr. Pushkar is here with us um, in the audience. Um, so we'll go to him also. But the question to Dr. Mittal. How can we strengthen the health system to make NCDs in women a national priority? And is there a current national policy regarding NCDs in women? So, uh, Dr. Pushkar. 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 
I think uh, uh, NCDs is moving towards a national priority kind of stage, although the, the approach is quite fragmented as I see it, but there is an effort to make it comprehensive. And obviously, women will be part of that NCD approach. So there's no question, you know. But the issue is about how to, uh, you know, uh, bring the focus on issues specific to women and NCDs. And I think uh, I have some old lines that Veena is very well aware of. And I think that, uh, I mean, GDM is the lowest hanging fruit. I mean, why? Even though every society, every uh, even governments recommend screening for blood glucose by a blood glucose a measurement during pregnancy, still it doesn't happen. I'm not even sure it's happening in, 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 in Delhi all the time. We had 10 years ago spoken to the Delhi government and they almost agreed and everything was done to, to screen it systematically and keep data, you know. And at the same time also do a, do a TSH during pregnancy. You know, and it is, doesn't cost that much now at least for uh, m richer municipalities and everything. But somehow it's not happening. So I think if you ask me, that offers a unique window of opportunity that you don't get for men. Uh, if you screen uh, women for GDM, you're not, you not, of course, the usual thing about affecting them, affecting their children, etc. But basically, you're diagnosing pre-diabetes in a way, or whatever you call it, pro-diabetes, pre-diabetes. So someone who has GDM, most of them, almost all, will convert to diabetes. So, so not only are you affecting the child and the and the child's future. So you're doing many things. So this is one example of the kind of tight approach. Give us direction on, you know, who will listen to us. Uh, thanks, ma'am, for inviting me. Uh, having worked nine years in the central government and now last seven years in PHFI, uh, for uh, first of all, I'll just add first the uh, government's perspective always. Uh, last five to six years, the NCD program from the government has really taken quite a bit. Now right. they, uh, for the Specifically, I'm not going to the women first. For the non-communicable diseases, now we are screening males, females above the age of 30 for diabetes, hypertension, cervical, oral and breast cancer screening. This was on paper policy by the central government. But over the last few years, it has really go gone down below to the sub-centers which have been upgraded to the health and wellness centers now. Uh, to the NCD clinics are at PSCs and CSCs as well. So it's really work on the NCTs are, have taken place. This is not uniform across the states. So you will have Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and other states which are really quite advanced and UP and Bihar are slowly gaining forward. But apart from the health systems, the drugs availability, now even the, from metformin to insulin are being provided. Though the central government has framed the gui guidelines, it is the state governments which have to do the implementation. Provisioning and funding is provided by the central governments. It's still going to take any policy takes years, maybe five years down the line for it to be uniformly. And all organizations, this is the governments, but private sectors, Foxy has been partnering for the antenatal screening and other areas and different IMA and all as well. But in the private sectors, of course, the patients have to take a pitch forward. GDM guidelines have been revised and are being implemented. So we have screening for women during uh, twice during the pregnancy. So you identify the GDM and drugs are uh, management is being provided, even insulin by the government sector. So things are slowly making an effort. But India being a vast country, there's so many pregnancies are on all, it will take quite some time. And we also, everybody has to shoulder uh, responsibility. So with Dr. Usa Shiram, ma'am, and so many others, Dr. Imadi Wakar, Dr. Mittal, even we had prepared a women's health program initiative and a lot of curriculum. So education for doctors was also one of the agenda which we had taken it forward. Madhya Pradesh government has implemented it across. More than 600 doctors in, in Madhya Pradesh have been educated for the women's health initiative and non-communicable diseases. So this is the second aspect also I wanted to add. And Dr. Monica would like to add anything else. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, there's a, um, yeah. Go ahead, Monica. 
Uh, I would just like to add the specific question on whether um, there is a women priority in NCD program. The national NCD program does not have a specific priority for women. Yeah. So definitely need for bringing that up. Um, women are only seen to be important for the RCH program, the reproductive and child health program. That is where they get priority and nowhere else. Even if I talk about other national programs, whether it is tuberculosis or it is um, uh, tobacco control, uh, issues are very, very different for women and they are unaddressed. So having a task force uh, which would bring up these issues and sensitivities that need to be looked at would be the need of the hour and I would strongly encourage Divas to be pioneering that. I love you, Monica. Now we know why you are on the panel. <laughs> so just a quick one. I happen to be on the uh, governing council of the Aishman Bharat program also. And there is a lot of effort uh, the way Prashant was describing. But there is huge state to state variation. It's not minor. There is a huge state. I mean, you know, some people are picking it up very well and it's going ahead. Otherwise, the health and wellness clinic took a long time to start. They are taking off. But I think it will require a lot of effort on the ground. And the whole digitization campaign can only work uh, if there is care on the ground. Otherwise, what will you digitize? Correct. So I think uh, it's very important that that is not lost. In the, in the whole maze and certainly uh, I agree with Monica completely that there is no sincere effort to have a different sort of uh, different uh, profile or a different section for women in the NCD project. So before we go to the next question to Rajiv, um, so I, I, I'm so inspired by this, you know, go red and I just want to show you this was a uh, you know, this is how they go about uh, lunches and dinners and meetings and even small things like, you know, go have a kitchen table meeting of four people to 800 people in a big grand ball, you know, any which way to, to raise the noise level on heart health of women. And what that has done in this last, was started in, two, uh, so in 19 years, is they've actually shown the mortality was going up like this when they started it has gone down this way. So actually, gender-specific approach has made a difference in outcome. It's not just a, you know aspirational thing, but made a actual in the gro ground level a difference, which is really what uh, you know all of us here, I think we should choose a color and we'll do these things. Yeah. So the next question is for Dr. Rajiv Kubil. Uh, how can we build a movement to raise awareness like Go Red? Barriers, funding, priorities, access to care. Um, thank you so much. Um, I can just speak from personal experiences. Um, I think that the biggest problem is health literacy. You know, whether it's men or women. You know, uh, our narrative, our communication never reaches. So I think, especially from from the women perspective. I think uh, we did something called Rang De Neela, where uh, we tried to marry health literacy and art. And there's a WHO paper on it that your communication can better if you marry art into medicine or healthcare or into your health literacy communications. So I think all these movements, if we can have a non-medical approach to it, you know, like, like this or maybe a social approach, or could also be um, uh, like uh, our schools, our, our textbooks could be the best medium for nutrition, for nutrition in women, for, for, uh, for making men or, or boys sensitive to the problems. You know? It could go a very, very long way. And I think if we give these kind of different thought processes to our, our, our people in power, you know, I think then things can change. You know, because doctors saying the same thing, nutritionists saying the same thing, I think they, they would say, Inka to kaam hai karna. You know, we are not taking that seriously. It's time that there's a movement and I, th I think if, if we approach the movement in, in, in a way that, Madam, you are looking at and, and with the PHFI, NCDs, many other national bodies coming together and doing that, then the acceptance is going to be better because we are looking at lay people. We are, we are not looking at people who are health literate and there is no health literacy in India. So you need to go to their, their level to get the narrative right, that's what. Yeah. So the uh, Go Red program 
to get started cost $75 million. Just to put it in perspective. So the American Heart Association did a brilliant thing. They called a big advertising group and said, you raise $75 million with the campaign. So first what they did was they actually you know, um, did all this stuff and raised the money. And then, of course, um, uh, it, you, you know, it goes on autopilot and runs by itself. So we need to raise $75 million. Uh, so again, Dr. Monica, for you, is public-private partnership the solution? Uh, um, we do have very successful models of public-private partnership and uh, Dr. Pushkar mentioned about capacity building and training initiatives that PHFI has undertaken for diabetes management and care and he can speak more. But uh, something that uh, has been done in the school setting, there was a question on school, was a kids program which was uh, children with diabetes and we addressed both type 1 and type 2 in this, at the same platform. So this was um, funded by Sanofi and uh, the International Diabetes Federation, Dr. Arjna Sarda, Dr. Nikhil Tandon, many were involved in the advisory co um, committee. So uh, it was a program where we wanted to, one, get a, a solution in the school setup where the schools are empowered to embrace a child with type 1 diabetes because they themselves were uh, very, very, uh, uh, you know, hesitant to accept a type 1 diabetes child. So training teachers, uh, one, to identify the red flags. They are the first ones who would be able to see if a child is lethargic or um, not paying attention. Uh, regularly going to the uh, washrooms in between the classroom. So uh, 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 that way teachers uh, become again a very important stakeholder in early diagnosis. Um, then we worked with the school infrastructure, being able to store insulin in the school setting. The school medical officers did have some knowledge but not again uh, had the skills to be able to manage if there is an incident all of a sudden. Um, what should the child be doing for physical activity periods? They were not allowed to be uh, active in physical activity. They were not taken on school teams. So uh, working with the whole system. So the point I'm trying to make is, again, we need a very comprehensive uh, intervention when we want to work with schools and uh, we need to engage uh, the uh, child with type 1 diabetes but also type uh, children who are non-diabetic, they also need to get uh, uh, information about healthy lifestyles and how to prevent type 2 diabetes when they are adults. So when we uh, take that information both for type 1 and type 2, then there is no discrimination. The stigmatization of a type 1 diabetic child also goes away because you are getting the same message about healthy lifestyle. Uh, that became a very important bonding because then we were also able to, through social media, connect parents. And there was a good support system in the school setup available because parents could talk to each other and uh, you know understand how are you managing your child's diabetes or if there is resource crunch, how are you managing uh, the, those because the treatments can be very, very expensive. So uh, having a private sector support that kind of program which provides health literacy but at the same time skills is a model that we found was very successful in Delhi and then taken through Dr. Archana Sarda and and many others in Kolkata, Maharashtra, and there is a lot of demand still for that program. Um, and yes, we need a lot of funding, but some things which we tried were low cost, uh, and we can do with the low cost funding is Nukar Nataks, role plays, um, uh, which the students did in the community setting. So some of these communication uh, techniques, which are very traditional for us, are also very effective, but low cost. Thank uh, you. Usha? Uh, with uh, Pushkar, Monica and Abrishi giving their inputs on the policy, we would like to say that through the professional organization as otherwise also we've again repeatedly emphasized that for women's health care after the RCH, after her reproductive era, in fact there's no policy for 40 plus, the menopausal, the whole uh, you know bracket is empty. So at least what to start with something that is doable. There are millions of hyperglycemics and hypertensive patients in pregnancy. We could pick up at least that subsect and get them onto the NCD link. They should never, never be allowed to let go in the population to themselves. There has to be some little structure.
to connect this and that would be a first step which you know if we apply our minds it is doable and then we will and again coming back to whatever is possible you do it's with that concept that we uh, put forth to the OBGYNs what can you do not to miss a single hyperglycemic patient in pregnancy and it was very overwhelming for them to you know uh, go by the standard test so we said at least do this and believe me that even this even in the government coverage 28 percent of our antenatal women are tested for sugars and we have not reached anywhere close to 100 percent and we are working our way out with the newer devices where even the last mile can be reached with a fasting sample etc so the journey is still unfinished and we acknowledge the deficiencies which exist today but we are working our way for a better tomorrow we have lots more to discuss but because uh, there is a clock to watch there uh, we'll open the discussion for all panelists and i would actually welcome people from the audience to come and speak on things which are relevant to them so uh, so this, this is uh, something which is open for all panelists and anyone who wants to ask come and please join in yeah i would like to comment one thing ma'am please i think rss doe i think dr purvi chavla we have to acknowledge because on the social media platform lot of community yes. education programs in all the regional languages is also being conducted and IMA Women Doctors Wing has taken up this fine project of uh, cancer screening of breast cancer and cervical cancer screening and with FOXI also they are doing and in the API also we are doing the community level programs at the regional levels. I think unless we have the cohesive organizations of all the IMA, APA, IAP, FOXI and everything and with the help of the PHFA we have a structured formula for the public outreach programs then definitely we will be successful because social media platform is the best form. If you can hear the color tune of the COVID, how the COVID vaccination has entered into the brains and ears of uh, millions of the people, the same yeah. thing can go with the NCDs also. Thank you very much. Yeah. So these are the few of the points which Dr. Dina, please. I think um, sometimes I also want to promote the fact that uh, when we are talking about women empowerment, we have to give out the right message that it's not about men and women being equal. So we are not equal in the sense and that or we are not superior, you know, because especially when in the schools or when we are at work or with our colleagues, we don't, we want to say that we are different and women need to own that. that we might have some assets and we might have some things, uh, values that are different. But just because we are women, I think when we call about equality, we want to talk about rights, we want to talk about other things. Because sometimes I think in adolescence, in children, when you tell the children that men and women are different, living in a society with the South Asian society, we know that our girls can, there might be some safety issues. So it is very important for the right message to go that when we are talking about equality, we are talking about uh, our rights, but of course we are different and that whatever difference there is between men and women, women have to own it as females. Yeah. So I think that's the message. So the slogan that I have in all our divas thing is men and women are equal, but not the same. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's no question of different or anything. Not the same. We have our own, you know, com so absolutely so right. The same thing I think applies the problem is that we, we, we are different, but that has not been acknowledged in any of the research studies, for example. They assume that whatever applies for men applies to women, which is what is causing a lot of issues yeah. today. Hmm. Yeah. What is good for the goose is not for the gander. So very quickly, uh, Shalini and Meena, if you can comment on, uh, you both have leadership roles in RSSDI. Uh, one is the chairperson, one is the secretary of RSSDI Delhi chapter um, and if you can say talk about uh, what that position can do for promoting women's health. Two weeks back I had a woman who was type 2 diabetes and reported to an emergency and uh, with Ghabrat and women are 
more likely to be ignored if they have pain it's like she's malignant or and the diagnosis written and i have the prescription is anxiety neurosis and she was sent home with some alprax and pantoprazole and 6 hours later she had infarcted and we have the ecgs when she reached the hospital she had an anterior wall mi so the first thing is yes women are underrepresented in trials and the example given was that uh, she, she might become pregnant so trials are expensive things and so and then we translate the whole thing into the drugs that come up and what uh, i agree with what uh, dr deena said that women themselves so it's such a challenge to start uh, oral semaglutide in a woman or injectable uh, glp1 because it is expensive so women themselves and if you say your husband needs it she's the one saying yes 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 please go ahead and write it if uh, so the uh, first thing is that women have to acknowledge that their health matters and yes one important is so i read this very nice catchy word called bikini medicine which means and usha and we have discussed that it means that women's health was focused on breast health and reproductive health for a very long time and now we have to raise our voices that it's metabolic health bone health mental health all these are also important Thank so you. i think that's the <laughs> exactly uh, ma'am pertaining to your question on women in leadership roles i think we are seeing the change uh, compared to maybe a decade or two back how many women were actually seen in most of the organizations if you look at the structure of esi you look at the structure of rssdi api ima you see a lot of women leaders emerging so i think it's it's the stereotypes that need to be broken of course it's very clear that as women it's more of a responsibility to manage everything to be in that role because you know we've always been caregivers so you know every time i need to go out for a lecture to a different city i need to check whether my daughter has an exam or not and this is something that has been part of our uh, bringing up and part of our responsibility so i think it does not mean that if i have to be a leader i have to ignore the family completely and be out there i think it's just more of a balancing act that we need to do a man probably would not really refuse on every invite to travel to a different city because the child has a test on monday so sunday i cannot be there i need to be home uh, tutoring her compared to that of course as a woman you have a little more hats to wear but i think it's how gracefully you wear them and it's all about time management a lot of women are emerging a lot of women are doing great things and we're all example of that so with rssdi i mean delhi chapter this is the first i, I think we're the only chapter where today the chairman and the secretary are both women yay so i think that's a great achievement to tell that the organization of course uh, does not really discriminate if you have it in you if you're ready to give that much of time and attention and work i think uh, you have all the avenues open so yes we need to move forward and we need to just balance things in a better way rather than saying that you know women do not get an opportunity so i think dr amrish was right we are here because we deserve it and we should not be here because we were women so uh, yeah yeah we're not here because we women we we on that earned this place was... we worked in the organization and i think that's what the message is for all women you need to just keep working and you need to all be do together we, is it that we need to work harder harder yes no, 100% that's, that's what i said we need to wear a little more maybe two extra hats compared to the men we need to work much harder not little harder much harder and, and that shouldn't be we need to balance everything that yeah i be. think that's why i see, say that see when you we cannot see break that in the old, i agree uh, just a joke that I when agree. we see a woman deity she has many hands yes when we see the ravan he has many heads yes <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up all so but yes the change is happening it. you see the men being more uh, you know the change is happening it. it takes time to break the stereotypes we are breaking those stereotypes it's just a matter of time that we will go in the right direction it's just that the determination and the way we bring up our sons that's something that's very beautiful you have said yeah you have sure. to teach your son to take equal responsibility no, sons yeah. can that's important that. we have a so just to uh, you know talk to all the uh, young women here um, that it's not uh, don't be happy with just a seat at the table but you know work towards the, the head of the table yes. that you actually become and the reason is personnel is policy whoever is the person there makes the policy and so unless there are women in leadership positions the policy won't change you know some truths are very hard and not very uh, you know palatable but be that as it may it is the truth so we have to strive hard 
to get to leadership positions. It may be harder, like Bina said, but it has it to is, be done. It is. And only then you can actually no. change policy. See, I want a women-centric NCD program. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get that? So, right? So for that, you need women leadership. And for that, of course, as Amrish said, you know, you, you, you build your skill sets. You come up with that level of excellence and the competence. And then only you can become a leader. So completely agree.